Hello everyone, Professor Philip Travis. This is a short video announcement for my American History courses, and it is about the United States' entry into the First World War. If you are part of my American History courses, please make sure to refer to the readings and assignments page in our content area in our online course so that you can keep up with exactly what our reading assignments are this week as well as uh, what our assignments are for this week. If you're watching this video and you're not in one of my classes and you found this on YouTube, um, and I'd say this to my students as well, if you enjoy this type of video, please subscribe to my channel, History Changes. Uh, in addition, you might find some interesting information in, in this video about World War I, even though this is a shorter sort of announcement video. I do have, for everybody, and of course my students will be watching this this week, a four-part video lecture on the United States' entry into the First World War, also, of course, found in my uh, YouTube channel, History Changes. World War I was a pivotal moment in American history. In many respects, it is the origin point for the emergence of the United States as a world power, albeit we don't really see that come to full fruition until the end of the Second World War, the emergence of, of the Cold War. But in a lot of respects, the modern United States as a world power is a product of um, the experience and aftermath of the First World War. And for um, those of my American history courses, your, your sort of factoid for this week is going to be to kind of summarize some of the key points in this video. World War I, of course, you know, began in 1914, in the summer of 1914. It began following the assassination of the Austrian Archduke, the heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand. And the war really officially began at the beginning of August 1914. Franz Ferdinand was assassinated at the end of June 1914. Ferdinand was assassinated by a, uh, a Serbian nationalist, a part of a Serbian nationalist group that... Uh, sought greater territory to the nation of Serbia from the large and expansive sort of old uh, world empire of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When that conflict began, the United States was very much intent on staying out of it. You see here uh, President Woodrow Wilson, a little fact about Woodrow Wilson, he's the only American president to hold a PhD, and even though Woodrow Wilson's presidency became sort of involved a number of different interventions in the world. Um, in fact, before the beginning of World War I, the United States had its army invading Mexico as Mexico was embroiled in, in a civil war, a revolutionary conflict that the United States hoped to sort of shape the outcome of. Uh, Wilson was involved in a number of interventions, despite the fact that in his own perspective, he was rather um, an idealist in international affairs, though some historians have, have debated whether or not we should call him an idealist, but um, he, 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 he was not an advocate of sort of being a war president. Some historians have even called him a, a pacifist. But nonetheless, during his presidency, he was embroiled in a number of conflicts, the most significant of which, of course, the First World War. And the United States doesn't become involved in the First World War directly until the spring of 1917. The First, the First World War was a particularly devastating conflict. You see here a photo of British soldiers um, at the Battle of the Somme of 1916. Uh, the Battle of the Somme, the opening days of the Battle of the Somme remains to this day the most destructive day in British military history. Um, there were some, in the first week or so leading up to the beginning of the battle, there were something like 1.5 million artillery shells fired at the enemy lines. It was an incredibly destructive battle that really sort of epitomized the just incredibly destructive nature of the First World War. This was, in a lot of respects, um, the first fully industrial war, um, albeit the American Civil War, the Crimean War in the 1850s were also sort of the beginnings of industrial warfare. 
But the battle of the, well, the First World War, the Battle of the Somme being an aspect, an element that gives us a lens into this, the First World War is really the first truly uh, industrial war, the most destructive war fought in Europe since the Thirty Years' War um, in the early 1600s, 1618 to 1648. And, of course, this conflict brought to bear explosive shells. Um, it brought to bear uh, machine guns, which, of course, have been around for a little while, but uh, the full capacity of these destructive weapons. Um, new advanced technology that was in its infancy, uh, the tank, uh, the submarine or U-boat, for example, uh, larger, more powerful navies. It was a massively destructive conflict. And this conflict, of course, the United States sought to stay out of. It, uh, the United States, for really its roughly century and a half existence when this began, had really defined itself around remaining in its hemisphere, staying out of the old world affairs, particularly those involving European conflicts. This all really changes with the First World War, and this is one of the reasons why World War I is such a pivotal moment in American history. Um, has anybody ever heard the term isolationism? I imagine we probably all have, and usually we think about that term in the 1930s, leading up to the Second World War. The term isolationism as in a, a way of an American defining their position when it comes to whether or not the United States should be involved in um, military conflicts abroad, particularly. That is a term that emerges from the First World War, particularly because at the end of the First World War, Woodrow Wilson championed a new internationalism. He hoped the United States would ratify the Treaty of Versailles, that it would agree to many of his 14 points, which were points designed in his idea to make the world a place that was safer for the United States and American sort of Western democratic style governance. He advocated freedom of the seas, free trade, uh, self-determination, though he did not really apply that to people of the, colon the colonized uh, developing world, but nonetheless is a really important ideas. He proposed, of course, the League of Nations, which became a sort of um, a sort of um, precedent for the eventual formation of the United Nations after World War One. And he hoped he hoped the United States would join these, sign onto these things, and in so doing, agree to a greater role in and a greater involvement in world affairs. There was a great deal of pushback on this at the end of the First World War. The United States never signs the, the, the Treaty of Versailles. It never joins the League of Nations. It never agrees to a security agreement with countries like France. It did not want to be tied to um, an international system that might pull it into another conflict. But nonetheless, regardless of that, the path is really created with the First World War to take the United States on a more international uh, footing, and it really creates the basis, the foundation for the United States to become a world power, though that sort of emergence as a global superpower, if you will, you don't really see that occur until it's experienced in the Second World War and, of course, the beginning of the Cold War. So that's a big reason to study the First World War. Another major reason to study the First World War from the United States perspective, is that the First World War also brought to light many big questions about American freedoms and civil liberties during a time of war. Uh, during the war, the United States passed, and this wasn't entirely unique. Similar things were done during the second presidency of John Adams, uh, during the disputes with France. Um, these similar things were done as well during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson's administration uh, brought forth something called the Espionage and Sedition Acts. And under these acts, the United States, among other things, effectively made uh, free speech a, 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 a much more regulated type of activity and uh, 
certain types of speech could result in a person being imprisoned under these under these acts under the interpretation of these acts in addition the united states during this war uh, had an internment program and there were many different people internment meaning temporary imprisonment uh, because individuals were deemed to be a potential threat um, a security threat in the united states and these particularly targeted german nationals so individuals that were german citizens living in the united states who maybe hadn't become citizens yet right um, German nationals, it could be working and living in the United States, farming or, or owning a business um, with the intent to become a citizen, but had not become a citizen yet. The United States actually interned some 6,000 German nationals, um, sometimes with legitimate legal positions, other times with very weak sort of uh, uh, basis for any idea that these individuals may have been a security threat in the United States. So these actions, the, the uh, regulation of free speech, the internment of German nationals and some other individuals, the widespread use of propaganda on the part of the government, these give rise to some important questions about uh, the liberties and freedoms of Americans and those living in the United States during a time of war. Eugene V. Debs, the uh, progressive socialist union organizer and workers advocate, was actually arrested for giving a speech in Canton, Ohio. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a speech that advocated violence. It was just an anti-war speech. And uh, the socialist uh, Eugene V. Debs was, in fact, in prison for a long term, um, not receiving uh, release until he was um, allowed release during the presidency of Warren G. Harding following Woodrow Wilson in the early 1920s. So, and that gave rise to the emergence of the American Civil Liberties Union and a, and a complete reinterpretation of what free speech means and what are the extents allowed of free speech, particularly during a time of war. So these are some of the big questions um, that we have to think about. Uh, what types of rights do Americans and, Amer and, and those living in the United States have during a time of war? Uh, where are the boundaries for this? The Espionage and Sedition Acts were actually found constitutional by the Supreme Court, though that very same Supreme Court later did not exactly find those unconstitutional, but made decisions asserting a more liberal interpretation of the right to free speech. These are some major questions that we have to think about as Americans today in the 21st century. The United States has become an emergent world power in a, in a globalized international system. Understanding, understanding the, the positives, the benefits of that, as well as the sometimes the negatives of that, the consequences of that, uh, is very, very significant um, conversation to have in American history. So this week, looking at the First World War, we're going to be thinking about, there's some primary sources I want us to look at this week, and we're going to be thinking about, particularly through those primary sources, as well as our reading our text and our video lectures, how should we look at the rights of Americans to uh, freedom of speech, other protections, um, the right to be free from imprisonment without charge, for example. How should we think about this during a time of war? How do we evaluate this? How do we think about the emergence of the United States as a world power? We need to understand this as a really critical turning point in American history. And it really is the beginning of what becomes known as the American century. I'll see everyone this week um, in the class. And let me know if you have any questions. Again, just write a summary of what you think some of the most important points of this video were. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll see everyone in the class this week.